Good afternoon. I'm happy that all of you are here. My name is Terry Wolverton, and um, we're celebrating 20 years of the COLA Fellowships. And I'm excited to sit with each of you to talk about um, feminism and LGBTQ intersectionality, uh, if I may use that word. And we wanted to just begin by asking each of you to give us your name, uh, your art medium, and uh, how long you've lived in LA or your history with LA. So Denise, may I start with you? My name is Denise Uehara, and I'm a performance artist and a writer. I work in solo and ensemble forms, and I came to L.A. in the late 80s. I now live in Tucson, Arizona. Hi, my name is Phyllis Green. I came here in 1979 to go to graduate school at UCLA and uh, I stayed a lot longer than I thought I would and I consider that my career, professional career, started in 1981 when I graduated from UCLA and I've been here with the exception of one year um, and I went back to Vancouver, British Columbia, where I came from. Um, I've been here ever since, first in downtown, then in Mar Vista and then a little more in downtown and now in Santa Monica. I'm a sculptor, I'm an object maker, uh, but I, along the way I have also done a animation, video, um, and I'm just starting to dabble in performance. I'm Jessica Rath and I came out here for grad school as well in 94 and have stayed in Silver Lake or the area of Silver Lake for 25 years, I guess. And I work, I'm a sculptor predominantly, or that's the way I think. And then I work in a lot of different mediums, film and drawing and uh, printmaking as well as performance and sound. I'm Sherry Galke and I moved to LA in 1975 to be involved with the Women's Building and the Feminist Art Movement. Um, proud uh, resident of Silver Lake. And uh, my medium is uh, performance art for many years, but also installation, public art, video, and uh, now writing as well. You've already met me. Um, I moved to Los Angeles in 1976 uh, from Detroit because of the Women's Building. And um, feminism and queer identity had everything to do with my getting to Los Angeles. Um, I needed a place where I could uh, bring those identities together with my artwork uh, and was so happy to find uh, the Women's Building and the LGBT community as well. Uh, and I am primarily a writer. Uh, I have a long history uh, in performance, and then I've dabbled in lots of other things. Hi, I'm Martian Delellis. I'm a visual and performance artist and writer who uses puppets and dolls often. I've been here for 10 years, or maybe more, since 2006. Um, I was the COLA Fellow last year and I got introduced to the COLA Fellowship because I was helping my mentor, Janie Geyser, with her 2006 um, exhibit, and then I moved here to come to grad school. I've lived in Boston, Providence, New York, and Chicago. My name is Colleen Sterrett, and I moved to Los Angeles in 1977. Um, originally from Chicago, uh, a year spent in San Francisco before I got here. But I moved here to go to graduate school at Otis. And uh, like Phyllis, ended up staying a lot longer than I uh, intended to. So I've been here for 40 years. And uh, I guess I consider um, um, myself definitely a Los Angeles artist because of that. And uh, I'm a sculptor. Uh, I also do drawings. And uh, I got my COLA Fellowship in 2007. 
Hi, I'm Kashila Brook, and I moved here in 1992 to take a position at CalArts um, in Valencia. And first I lived in Mount Washington, and then I moved to Silver Lake. And I got kind of stuck in Silver Lake because I couldn't um, afford to buy. Uh, and I was renting for many, many years in Silver Lake, hating all of the gentrification that was happening around me. And then I was able to move to Tahunga, so now I'm a mountain woman, um, which I'm just so happy about. This is much more me than urban living in many ways. I'm originally from Oregon um, and was a country lesbian, um, lived out in the country, was not career-oriented at all, um, and then kind of came to art later. Um, and that sort of like made my way to CalArts in 92 after being in Tucson, uh, where I went to grad school, and then uh, San Diego, where I was teaching, and also teaching in Chicago, and then I ended up at CalArts. So yeah, I've ended up staying in a place that I never imagined, being an Oregonian, that I would live. And now I'm thrilled to be um, near the mountains. I work with photography and video and text and image. Uh, I also write and um, I guess that's, and a little drawing here and there. All right, um, you all gravitated towards this particular panel because um, uh, the, the question was artists who embed feminist or LGBTQ uh, ideas in your work. So our first question um, that we like everybody to answer is what is it about your work that reflects feminist and or queer identities in, in its forms or content? Um, I'm, um, I'm a maker of things. I, my education at UCLA centered on uh, ceramics and I Ceramics was one of the media that's considered uh, woman, women's work and was uh, had second class status in the modernist pantheon and so I was challenged by that to take it up more and um, I was discouraged from making little things in graduate school um, my work got bigger and bigger until the mid-90s when I did the body of work for which I was awarded the COLA grant and I decided that I was going to make um, small, playful work loaded with decoration and ornament, which I thought was antithetical to the modernist strategy. And I feel like I really found myself there and that was a work that I loved. Well, I can honestly tell you that um, I'm here um, not for really either one of those categories. In a sense, uh, I looked at all of the salon uh, conversation topics, and there really wasn't one that particularly fit me. Uh, and I really wasn't going to do this. Uh, a friend was in town over the weekend, and we were we came to the opening. <coughs> Excuse me, we came to the opening. And we were talking about the salon conversations. And I said, well, there, are, there aren't any. I don't know what I, what I would pick and why I would come to any of them. Uh, well, she said, you're a sculptor. And I thought, well, um, yes, that's true. Uh, I started um, making sculpture in 1976. Like I said, I went to graduate school at Otis beginning in 77. And um, the sculpture world that I grew up in was a very um, heavily male-dominated world. And to be taken seriously in that world uh, was very difficult. Uh, uh, and I think it has been, making sculpture has been a very hard road for women to navigate. And um, as we've seen recently in that um, revolution in the making at Hauser Wirth, um, all of the women who were in a sense left out of um, the dialogue uh, because they were women and they were making work with particular kinds of materials. But anyway, um, I chose to be here because of that, because I felt that it was important to 
uh, find a way to talk about what I have done and what has been meaningful to me about being in Los Angeles. And uh, when I got here in 77, like I said, I'm originally from Chicago and then spent a year in San Francisco. What I was amazed about uh, Los Angeles, and I still am as I traverse the city, is its uh, great expansiveness and openness that in a way allowed for a lot of freedom and there did not feel like there was this heavy historical um, burden and context that I had come from. Um, so being here as a sculptor felt easier um, and I think that that had a lot to do with uh, just the city itself and uh, the expansiveness, the openness that gave an air to um, why many artists have, have come to LA. So I was really fortunate after I graduated from UC Irvine. Um, I stumbled upon Highway's performance space and ended up living next door to the space. Literally, my, my wall was the, shared with the other side was the green room of the space. So the walls were so thin that I either had to go to the performance I, or I felt like I was in it anyway because it was just so loud. And I remember one of the first pieces that came through was Ron Athey and his body piercing piece and it was a whole troupe. And I had, I was just, it just blew my mind. Um, and I continued to stay there for, I, I think it was over, I definitely over 10 years, probably more like 15. And it was an entire beehive, the 18th Street Art Center which was the larger umbrella, and then Highway's Performance Space was a huge synergy of queer performance, people of color, um, working class poor, uh, the Los, Los Angeles Poverty Department was there, My, so, and, and feminism. And um, it was founded by Tim Miller and Linda Berman, and um, the NEA4 came through. Uh, and I, that was my education, basically. So as I was creating solo work and coming out as queer and bi, um, I also was with an ensemble called the Sacred Naked Nature Girls. And we performed and toured. Um, we performed in the nude. By the end of our, our series, we were clothed, but we, our work, we were a culturally diverse group. So it was Akila Oliver Bella Hu, who's from Taiwan, um, Laura Myers, Danielle Brazel, and myself, and we were from different class backgrounds, which was important, I think, to, to mention, and uh, different, di different backgrounds uh, culturally, ethnically. And from that, we created work that was very much about, uh, Akila was very interested in creating work about spa uh, spaces of imagination. Uh, she called it, quoting Bell Hooks, fields, fields of desire, pornography, um, appropriation and we we would create these laboratory spaces where we would perform together and I I learned so much from that looking back on it uh, and basically that was the norm was um, women's space and queer space was was the, the my education basically in in that space and being from Orange County where it was a completely different scene and being one of the, you know an Asian American from Orange County I I learned just that that became my, my um, family and community for many, many years. I, uh, um, I, um, in the summer of 1974, I was exposed to performance art. I learned performance art and I was in the Midwest in Minneapolis um, at a school where, you know, nobody had even really heard of the art form at that point. And I heard that in Los Angeles at the Woman's Building at the Feminist Studio Workshop that they were not only, Suzanne Lacey was teaching performance art, but they were having performance art, feminist performance art conferences. And I, I just was so excited. And um, so that's why I moved to L.A. And... Um, like what you were saying, Phyllis, and what you were saying, Colleen, I was attracted to that medium because it was a medium that had not really been defined by men. It was wide open. And there was something about it that, as a woman, it felt comfortable because it had persona and costume and, you know, lots of, of those things that felt comfortable. So um, that was a very exciting time. And, and the woman's building was this 
and, and the city of LA was this very rich environment for, for performance art. And I feel that, like you were saying as well, that there's a kind of openness here and that what we were allowed to do at the Women's Building is, um, there weren't the pressures that I felt New York artists felt of the, the marketplace. You know, there's always just this intense like gallery scene there. Um, we were able to just kind of be more expansive in our thinking and be more inventive. And so um, what I think is very feminist about a lot of the work we did is a lot of it was collaborative um, at a time when, you know, the solo male artist working in his studio was, was what the art a definition of what an artist was. And we began, we were women, we were working with other women, we were inventing this new art form, we were interacting with communities, we were incorporating um, social and political critique into our work and thinking about how work um, art could have a function in society and make change in society um, through the question includes form and content so there was the, the the form stuff of performance and collaboration but then the content too was about violence against women or you know we did work about incest and uh, uh, and sexual abuse and um, lesbianism and just so many topics that were really um, initially kind of taboo almost in the art world in a way where the female voice was expressing ideas about those things. You, know, you might have seen those images of sexuality or sexual abuse, but not women speaking out about it. So, yeah. I wanted to add a couple of things just about um, my experience coming here. Um, and also to clarify, I mean, I am a feminist. I, my work does not uh, address feminist perspectives, you know, specifically. Uh, the work comes, my work comes out of process and materiality and abstraction. Um, but my background, I went to, uh, my undergraduate school was at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and um, it was considered uh, a foundry school. Sculpture was very much focused on casting and foundry, foundry work. I was the first uh, woman who was the shop um, assistant, which was a major big deal. Uh, that was in the mid-70s. I never had a female instructor until I got to Otis. And um, Betty Saar was my mentor at Otis, my graduate school mentor. And that, was, that in itself was an amazing experience uh, to come from the, the experience in, in, in Illinois in this foundry school, which was extremely macho extremely, um, of course, male-dominated. Um, again, to be taken seriously within that world is very difficult. Uh, but arriving in LA, coming to Otis, and um, having uh, that completely different experience of having a woman as a mentor was really extraordinary. And to say that to my young students now who um, just I think can't imagine not having a woman as a teacher. Um, anyway, I was also very fortunate that, um, and, and thinking, you talking about the women's building, I moved to downtown LA right after, gra when I was in graduate school. So I was part of a group of artists that were really, um, you know, like Phyllis, uh, you know, brand new to that area of downtown. There was really nobody there at the time. Um, the women's building was, you know, out in kind of the boondocks. And uh, I was uh, fortunately included in a show there, which I'm thrilled that that's on my resume from 1981. Uh, and I think the freedom uh, of being downtown, it was at the time that Lace started, um, like I had a space downtown for a brief period of time, but there was this amazing amount of experimental work going on that was supported. Um, and it was through the women's building lace and, the, and all the cooperation that seemed to happen in those artist-run spaces. Um, one thing I'd like to add about Los Angeles is that um, in addition to being attracted to this place because of the women's building, I guess I, uh, I sort of, when I, I, I grew up with the feminist art movement of the early 90s, uh, excuse me, early 70s. The early 90s was the second one. <laughs> the early 70s, and so I was, and I was, uh, 
I decided to be, be, pursue studies in art because of the feminist art movement. I, it seemed like, well, that was something to be an artist about. And um, when I came here, there were a lot of, I mean, there were a lot of things that seemed really uh, kind of straight things that I wasn't interested in. But there was also a lot of hybrid forms here. Like I'd never seen, I remember seeing Wallace Berman and Betty Saar, that work, I'd never seen work like that. And also there was a, a great availability of materials here because of all the manufacturing. and. Um, where I lived when, in Canada it was just not that way at all. It was hard to get things. And I, I laugh now saying that I really do most of my shopping on the internet. But in those days you had to like, you could drive around Los Angeles pretty easily. And um, you could drive to various places and get materials or get things plated. You know, um, downtown was very much uh, accessible that way. And so that made Los Angeles interesting also. I, um, I come from a, my mother was the 70s generation <laughs> and I grew up in graduate school with my mother when she left my father um, and went back for sculpture and printmaking. So I was, um, I had kind of steered away from art and then had come back to it and ended up in Chicago. And then um, both my parents had kind of left the art world and decided that they wanted to become mountain people um, and run a farm and, uh, and really had a great disdain for commercial work. And I had grown up on that uh, disdain for capitalism and for any kind of commercialization of art um, as anything other than a collective experience. So I was trying to find a way to make work on my own um, and have a practice that didn't necessarily involve the collective, but could still um, have a feminist perspective. And most of my mentors in Chicago were male. Um, and I was uh, learning sculpture there. Um, some of them were not. Um, but the people who helped me get out here, well, they were a combination of people, um, both male and female. But what I found over the years here in LA was that I didn't have to necessarily identify myself as LGBT or necessarily feminist in order to be independent um, and to assume that I could have a solo career here and that um, I could do that with a spouse or without or with a partner or without or with a child or without and that I could go anywhere I wanted to within the city and start to um, start relationships with fabricators or with people who were giving me materials. And there was an acceptance um, in the LA area that I could just walk in and form a relationship over and over and over again. And that then became something where I started to feel like I could do that with scientists. Um, and so I've been working with a lot of female scientists about their research and making work about their research, which their perspectives, at least the women that I'm working with um, directly, are very different than some of their male counterparts. And it was, it's, it's, there's an organic, I feel like I've been able to continue to evolve in the city, um, that I don't, there isn't an ideation of myself and who I should become, that I'm ever evolving. And as I evolve, the city um, can accommodate me, um, both in terms of supplies and fabricators and things like that, but also conceptually accommodate me. Like I can branch out and incorporate new materials and there's always room for me to expand. There's an acceptance that I could go into performance and talk about a feminist um, strike from the 30s, which I did for the MTA, or I could pull back and move into science or that I didn't have to be identified in one way, that the idea that my identity wasn't fixed. Um, and then I was also kind of raised here by um, Millie Wilson, who was my mentor. Um, and there was also an idea that I didn't necessarily have to identify as LGBT, and the work didn't have to be particularly feminist um, in its content in terms of particular issues, but that um, that relationship could grow and that, that all, of, all of what both of our works were doing could talk to each other in a way. It was, once again, it wasn't fixed, and I felt like I could become an artist and have the feminist intent without a fixed identity. Um, and the city continues to amaze me in um, how many different kinds of people that I meet all the time here and how welcoming it is um, in terms of how I evolve. Um, 
I wouldn't say that my work is directly LGBTQ, but it's definitely queer. Um, I have a lot of um, strong female protagonists that are often complicated. My last piece was about object sexuality, so it's not like directly LGBTQ, but it is pretty queer to be in love with the building. Um, so there's that. I definitely um, work in an area that involves craft, that has a feminist tradition, um, but also people like Mike Kelly that I'm inspired by um, that lived in LA. And I guess a lot of us were um, schooled in Chicago. I was as well in the 90s. And um, the, the education was really heavy on critical theory and feminism and dominated by like a field dominated by women more than men and LGBTQ people. And there was a lot of pornography going on at the time at school, encouraging it and producing it too. So that was interesting. We had Ron Athey come out there to visit. Um, so I knew a little bit about the LA scene and I remember, oh, as a kid, I definitely was inspired by Rachel Rosenthal. Like, I read an article in Omni magazine about her work and how she was an interdisciplinary performance artist and could traverse different mediums. And that really got me going on a path of performance art. And so I was lucky to have had an opportunity to work with her here um, while she was here. And what else? Oh, definitely the puppet community here in LA is more dominated by women than any other puppet community in all of the other cities I've lived in, Chicago, New York, Providence. So that's another really cool feature about LA. I probably started making art um, because I wasn't, I would go to the feminist bookstore in my town, which was called Mother Callie's and in Eugene, Oregon, and there were no images of lesbians that I liked. The, I didn't like the artwork, I didn't, they would be these kind of goofy, but they, they kind of look like Nagel drawings. You know, those, remember those Nagel drawings that used to be in the, with the, with the hair and the, you know, so there would be a kind of butch femme, and the femme, the butch would be kind of a soft bush, but with like hair like that. And, and um, so, and it, it was always very kind of cleaned up. It was a little too, wasn't perverted enough for me also. And, it didn't seem like the women that I was so excited about who I was around. So I started taking photography classes so that I could represent these different ideas about what it meant to be a dyke or what it meant to be um, a feminist or, uh, and I, so portraiture really was the beginning part and photography um, because I felt like I could sh fill in a gap and maybe that's the whole reason for me to make art at all anyway, is because I don't see what I want to see, so I make it so I can look at it. Um, and my work is not always about queer issues or always about lesbian issues, but then the works that are about queer and lesbian issues inform the works that are not directly on that topic. If I would have to say, they, they, they provide a discourse for the other works. So the project that I did for COLA in 2005 um, is an ongoing project about the history of lesbian bars. So that's a sort of documentary, kind of vernacular, um, architecture kind of project that spans four cities so far. <laughs> um, so, so COLA really gave me the chance to have funding to do the research. Um, and also for materials, but also um, 
the time to actually go around and find the sites and um, hire assistants to help me find uh, and document all the locations. Um, and another ongoing project that I've been doing since 92 when I moved here is um, called Tit for Twat, which is about Madame and Eve in the Garden of Eden and sort of this origin story. So it became a whole investigation of what is nature, what is, um, what is natural, because obviously nature and natural has everything to do with gender and sexuality and the way, way it fits into um, uh, enlightenment period um, natural history, right? So, so my two characters um, are very curious about what an original is and why that's important and what's nature. Um, so this kind of fuels all their curiosity and basically I'm curious. So. Um, and that uh, was Eve's big sin, uh, was curiosity. So that becomes the desire in this narrative is, is curiosity, just wanting to know, just, and mistakenly understanding things, which I think is an important way of putting, putting a history together is to read against the grain of history. So it's in another, in another, project, I might be photographing Griffith Park um, after a fire and as the um, landscape regenerates. So the, there's no Madame and Eve in that, there's no lesbian bar, there's no, presumably there's no um, subjectivity in that. But I can't really make an image without referencing this kind of position of who's the viewer and who's the maker and what the context is that this is coming out of. So I think it I think it's all about understanding the context that work comes out of for me. Um, I think that was the question, yeah, right? Great, yeah. thank you. Um, you know, as many of you have said, there is an issue of content, making work with feminist and lesbian content, and I certainly have done that. Um, there are processes uh, like uh, collaborative processes that um, seem to, or for me at least, have arisen out of feminism. Um, I'm also pretty interested in the idea of queer as a verb. Um, how do you go in and disrupt uh, a situation? How do you denormalize um, the thinking around an issue? Um, and the other thing that uh, really comes directly from the woman's building is the idea that as artists we're not in competition with each other that um, we will all gain a lot more if we are supportive of one another and share opportunities and it's been a big mission in my work um, since the woman's building to provide opportunities to women to uh, LGBTQ uh, artists and, and to artists of color and to really um, create a more robust environment for all of us to work in. Um, and I'm going to pitch another question um, that may or may not be our last question, which is how do you feel your work has contributed to a public dialogue and what is the influence you hope that you have had or that you hope to have? This is, uh, I think, um, um, my thoughts here are um, a response to the question you just made and also to the point you were making about mentoring. I, uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting and important about Los Angeles is the predominance of all the schools here. And uh, when I moved here, it was apparent to me that people kind of clustered around their, the school that they had gone to. And I, I know obviously there were a lot of people who came here to be involved with the women's building and clustered around the women's building. But I think that sort of sets up, and I've been teaching for a really long time also. I've been teaching at colleges and universities since, 1989, I, t I mean, 
before that, I had some teaching jobs, but from 1989 until 2015, I was uh, teaching part-time, and so I have had the opportunity to mentor a lot of women, and it really uh, expands my perspective. I have a, a young woman who helps me uh, as my studio assistant a couple of days a week. She was introduced to me by Jessica. She graduated from CalArts about three years ago, and, um, you know, my experience as a student is so different from hers, but to some extent the same. This morning, I picked up off the floor a slide that I had clipped to a, an aging piece of paper of a piece I did in 1980. <laughs> and she picked it up and said, 1980? I don't even know if she was born then. But, you know, she was, she still has the same, you know, her, she was visiting her parents. Her parents want her to come home because she finished school and she's not ready to go home. So she's struggling. And I told her that I, I used to have milestones. Okay, if I'm not doing this and this by the time I'm 35, I'll consider moving. And then, well, if I'm not in this position when I'm 40, I'll consider moving. And then, well, 45. <laughs> and here I am so many years later. So it's a, there's a sense of you're part, being part of a continuum here, I think. I would um, just, I'm going to jump right in on that, um, your response, because I have a very similar experience uh, again. I've been teaching since 1984, and I've had the great privilege to have taught at some of the um, big schools here. I was at the uh, Claremont Graduate School for about 12 years. I taught at Otis uh, uh, and uh, USC, and uh, the, I'm currently the uh, program head of sculpture at Long Beach City College, and the joke is always um, Colleen's taught everybody in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, so um, to just kind of reiterate what um, uh, Phyllis has said, I think that's the uh, great thing about the environment here in terms of the schools is um, uh, that there is this continuum. There are people that are teaching in our department that were my students. And uh, that kind of experience you don't really get very often. Uh, also, I would add that uh, in thinking about a women making sculpture and, and thinking about that the show that was at Hauser Worth last year, the amazing inventive work that um, has been produced by women sculptors has really influenced, I believe, a number, a couple of generations of younger artists to be interested in uh, materiality, object making, um, just that uh, a maker mentality. And I think that is a result of uh, women sculptors. Uh, and Los Angeles has become uh, like a sculpture city in many, many ways, uh, more so than, than other places. And I feel like I have been um, a, a, part, a strong part of that. So that's been very re rewarding. Something that you said, Terry, about queering and queering the dialogue. I, th I think for me, I wasn't planning on it, but it turned out that I ended up curating a weekend at Highways, Woman's <coughs> Space, called Not About Me. It was queer artists and people of color, artists of color, creating work not about themselves. And it was, mostly that was the tagline just to get people to come. But it turned out to be this interesting dialogue about how can we, does our identity stop at just our own personal story? I was writing a wave of a lot of um, in the in the late in the late eighties and early nineties of the the autobiographical form, the solo form, because it was easily tourable. It was um, post nineteen ninety two uprising. There was a need for that kind of work in the w women's movement, but also in the in for people of color and for queer identified people. But the identities became very much like this is it, me, this is my essentialized story. So what happened in that, I wasn't in the evening, but I wanted to ha see what other people came up with. I just kind of put that out there as a challenge. And it was a really, really amazing work. Um, 
that wasn't specifically about personal story, but became sometimes about someone else's story, but it just became about other things. And I think the idea of queering that dialogue uh, and and the way that we look at the world was became very important and became important in my work. And what I received the COLA for in 2006, seems so long ago now, was it, I had to challenge myself to, okay, so am I able to do that in my own work? So my work, it went from, instead of doing pitching a solo piece, I said, I want to do this piece about Okinawa, I'm uh, Okinawan on my father's side, and about colonization, about the U.S.'s occupation there on those islands, and, uh, and Japan's occupation. And, um, it w you know, it's funny because it really, in some ways, is framed by who you are, of course. But I, I started thinking about what are the women's positions as high priestesses in Okinawa in, in, in this work, and what is the the, what, what do we do with all of the destruction that the United States has caused and Japan has caused on these islands because of the Battle of Okinawa. And so it really took me to a different level in my own work where I had to think politically um, differently and I felt like, am I losing who I am in my own identity? And then I realized, no, this is just part of that evolution. And I felt like there was a, a very big shift during that time of, of artists many artists that supported that idea of like, we can do work beyond our own personal story. And that was, and I love that you, and I realize I have seen your work and I'm like, that is awesome. And it's just like, it's still, it's, it's a way of querying the work without being um, literal, I guess is the word. And, and I think that's where we've kind of come as a community and that's been really interesting for me. Um, what I think about being a woman and being a sculptor is that you are um, in a uh, position to do a lot of experimentation because you're not, you're less likely to be, you know, fit in commercially. And I think for me anyway, that my feeling like, okay, I'm still, I'm, I'm still gonna, I'm looking for something else. I'm looking for something else and not being, uh, uh, not being uh, responsible for putting together some kind of gallery exhibition every year or every two years uh, allows one to experiment and allows one to fail in a way that is, uh, is uh, enlightening. And it allows you to uh, look at things in a new way all the time. So. Um, you know, most of us have had to teach. Women I know in sculpture, you've had to teach, you have to do something else because it's really hard to survive in LA now um, making art. But I think it, it also is a gift in terms of doing new things and challenging yourself. Um, I wanted to talk about teaching a little bit because that's one of the primary public engagements that I have, and I actually love teaching, so probably I thought more about that as a goal than, um, than the other things uh, that we want, for, want in our careers. Um, so I've been happy in this matrix of people that I've met through, through my teaching career, um, both other colleagues as, who have become friends as well as students uh, and former students have become friends. And it's sort of amazing how you have to keep up in that profess profession, you know? You have to keep up and if you kind of fall behind and, and then, you know, it, you're exposed suddenly for, for not being up to date. Um, and so I, I like the game of that, I enjoy that, you know, and I enjoy being open uh, to the new ideas that that come from the students, but also that come from my colleagues who are in the field. Um, sometimes I find that my students, I have, I'm sort of having to pry their minds open a little uh, to get them to open up uh, as well to ideas that they weren't, um, didn't think they'd like at the start, right? Um, so I don't know, that is very public and in, in the, in the guise of that, I was thinking about the women's building, right? And the women's building was like an art project, but it was also an educational project. And um, it's always so amazing to me to read about the women who came from across the country to learn that they were gonna learn how to put up walls, 
drywall, paint, that that's what they were going to be doing, right? And um, the first, I think the first time, one of the very first times I showed in LA was in an exhibition at the Women's Building um, called Image and Text that was in 1987. And I was living in Tucson at the time and I was just thrilled um, to be showing there because I had been doing feminist radio for years and I'd always been reporting on what was going on in communities across the country um, as a part of the news, the news section. So um, it was sort of like being, my history wasn't the same as that, so it was exciting to become a part of that history, even if it was just a show in the gallery, right? And, and eventually, when the women's building closed as an active art space, it continued as a studio rental. So the first studio that I got in LA was at the women's building. And just outside my studio door, there was still the text on the wall from the uh, Chicago women's building that had been painted on the wall. And so when I would be in my studio and feeling isolated or frustrated, I would just go sort of in this little makeshift hallway and read that text over and over again and think that it must have been put up for some installation. Maybe you remember painting it on the wall, you know. Um, so the echoes of that history and that architectural history again were always chilling for me. And then a group of students at CalArts um, were working in the archives at CalArts and they discovered um, things from the original women's feminist art program and they didn't even know that that had existed at CalArts because CalArts, for some reason, doesn't wear it on its sleeve. Like, there's no banner on its website. It's not in its brochure material, even to this day, right? So these students organized an exhibition called The F Word, um, not an exhibition and a conference. And as they were organizing, they were trying to figure out how to do what feminists did in the 70s. So they wanted to do consciousness raising and they wanted to meet the women who'd been at the women's building. You probably met them at that time. And they were making various kinds of faux pas that they'd kind of come to me and they'd say, well, these women don't, aren't, they don't like us. They don't want to talk to us. And I was like, well, you know, you, there's a reason. <laughs> so there, that whole process was really wonderful for me just to sort of see it un unfold. And um, we had one meeting in my studio um, at the women's building, which was uh, for this F word symposium. I really liked what they did with that F word symposium. They actually broke it down into focus groups and, and it was less of the people on the DIOS kind of like talking to the rest of us. Then a number of years later, another group of grad students organized themselves again around the WAC show. Um, and this was a much more professionalized kind of event. Um, and uh, yeah, that was interesting to see how, how their career ambitions sort of got manifested in a different way within that context. So I guess that's some of the public um, thoughts I have about. Um, what I wanted to add to this question about public dialogue is um, that I think uh, one of the things we innovated at the Women's Building is this idea of including other voices in our work and, and seeing your own art as a vehicle for gathering the voices of others. And when I did my COLA, and we were the same year, 2005, um, one of the artist books that I did was called Marriage Matters, and it included um, Sears portraits of gay and lesbian couples and families reflecting on marriage. And of course, this is at a time when none of us thought we would ever have the right to marry. And um, so Sears portraits and then statements from these people. So I think that is uh, typical of that era. And f f you know, I think the public dialogue happens in, through our art. It happens through ourselves as organizers. I think of in the 80s when we organized um, 
a giant, um, in a parking garage in downtown LA, a giant anti-nuclear festival, and artists of all media came together to reflect on what was going on at that time. Or I think of, you know, I worked with teens in East LA to do the LA River Project and reflect on the river in the 80s. Um, even for me, which I consider a feminist artwork, is the Filipino World War II Veterans Memorial that I did, and to give voice to these Filipino World War II veterans. That to me, it's not about a women's issue, but it's a feminist work because it's inclusive of voices. Um, and then just one other point I wanted to make about that is this idea of creating public dialogue by taking artwork out into the streets and not being precious and seeing that art always has to be in galleries and museums, but that we had printing presses where we could print postcards and posters and we could plaster them you know, on the streets or we could um, do performance art in public settings and surprise people and create dialogue um, between audiences. So those are just a few things I wanted to contribute to that last question. I'm definitely interested in queer as a verb and even just being queer about your own queerness that you don't necessarily have to make work that's about your personal identity box that you're allowed to have opinions on the Kardashians or North Korea or the Middle East. Um, and I'm definitely... Uh, I hope I'm inspired by this John Waters quote that is he said something about his work being for minorities who feel rejected by their own minorities and I hope that's maybe an audience I can cultivate um, too and oh the piece I did for Cola last year where I made 13 oh, 1200 Raggedy Ann dolls that were distressed it became very process oriented and it wasn't like the plan but it became like a community thing where all of my friends came over and helped sew and distressed and bury and run over the dolls so um i guess there's some feminist tradition in that too um anyone else I was going to mention that um, in line with the teaching um, that um, I'm now teaching sculpture at Art Center after a long haul, um, that I'm also enjoying the fact that the way that curriculum develops here in the city has an allowance for a lot of different types of practices. So um, I teach writing, I teach research and um, I teach professional practices, but I also teach sculpture, that there's an acceptance that I could cross a lot of different mediums and I could bring research into, um, excuse me, into sculpture or performance, and that that's expected and, and that we can do it in a number of different ways. Um, and also that this city, I've met women from all over, and uh, LGBT people from all over the world that um, I don't know that I would have found in a different city and I um, so right when I think I know who I am or what kind of a feminist I am then I get someone else's experience that is so vastly different based on the political climate of where they've come from um, or what's really important to the issues of um, their people from wherever they are um, and mo a lot of my students are from um, I would say I think 60 percent at Art Center from our foreign nationals at this point so I'm uh, understanding the world um, in a way that is really quite phenomenal now um, with people from all over the world um, and a lot of LGBT and feminist um, perspectives that are just that are new to me and are challenging me um, and through classes that um, I can develop alongside them that it's accepted that our curriculum would develop um, and not be fixed once again where I feel like when I've applied to jobs elsewhere in the country there's a kind of fixing of what how a way that we should teach things and that we are very organic in the way that we develop curriculum because we have so many different types of people and that's the kind of city that it is that we would um, develop the curriculum alongside the students um, to fit their needs and that we would um, that in a way that becomes a collective and that becomes a, a conversation that I think is really important to the city too. I just wanted to add that in the current political climate, there's been a lot of fabulous street art that's very carnivalesque and it seems inspired by ACT UP and 
I was so proud of our city that our Women's March had maybe 750,000, which is the most, I think, of all the Women's Marches. And meanwhile, other parts of the country think we're all getting our asses bleached and we're all stuck in our cars and being like getting lip implants and stuff. So I was really proud of our city for that, too. I think the um, one of the things that I would say about the public is that um, within feminism, we thought about community in a, in a different way. Um, we thought about um, the idea that, that any, any individual and every individual has creativity within and that um, they, they have stories to tell, they have uh, expressions to make and encouraging that. And I'm also really interested in, in the changing relationship between what used to be artist and audience um, and how there was, you know, the artist was the expert and the audience was the recipient of that expertise and, and how that's dissolving and um, how it's much more of a dialogue among equals, among creative equals. Uh, and I think Los Angeles has been, um, even your example of the street art is kind of an example of that. Um, yes, plenty of people have credentials, but you don't have to have credentials to be creative. So let's all do a, a quick final round. And if you could reflect upon maybe some way in which COLA, your COLA grant helped you, uh, had an impact on your life, something that's very COLA and LA based is the question. We wanna really ground this in, in, in that. <laughs> Short. Oh, we're starting with me. Yeah. Sorry. Short. Short Kashila. <laughs> Is that possible? Um, the COLA grant was fabulous for me. I don't exhibit in Los Angeles as much as I do other places. So any to work on a project that had to do with the LA and also um, allowed me to explore LA um, while I was searching out these lesbian bar locations and interviewing people about their experience in these bars uh, was also giving me a chance to construct my own LA history um, and then it was amazing I did this big um, map drawing afterwards and I and people were able to help me correct it tell me no no that place was more like this you know you should change that and was a chalk drawing so I could erase it and change it. Um, and in terms of thinking about being in Los Angeles and making art in Los Angeles, it, the possibilities uh, for difference and for different kinds of practices I find very inspiring. I think I'm often inspired by friends and colleagues who are artists here and by um, just how different everybody's work is from each other, I guess. And that's something that might not be possible in the same way if we were in New York, which seems to have a much more kind of stylistic um, idea about what, what you can practice and what will be allowable in a certain way. So, and I am too much of an anarchist to submit to that. So I'm better on the West Coast. <laughs> so, uh, I got my COLA in 2006, and um, no, 2007. Uh, and I don't know if it, if it was um, uh, a particularly, um, uh, you know, special moment of, of what happened afterwards, but I think as I look back at, uh, I mean, I'm not, as a sculptor, I make pretty large sculptures, I don't, sell a lot of my work. Um, uh, my support has come from grants and fellowships and it seems that it happened at the right time. Um, I've, I've luckily gotten a, a grant or a fellowship um, maybe every 
uh, nine, ten years or so. Um, they've and they've happened when I needed it. I needed that kind of pat on the back. I needed this, uh, um, you know, encouragement to go forward with my practice and from my peers, essentially. And um, that's been great. And and Cola really fulfilled that in the same way. Uh, it it helped me continue. Uh, with what I was doing um, and what I um, have continued to do. I got my COLA fellowship in 2016 and it was personally a chance for me to um, exhibit in a space to make actual objects as opposed to my performance work that's more ephemeral and lasts for a short period of time and intangible and, and, and it also helped me figure out who my community is because it wasn't just people from the puppet community that were helping me make dolls it was people from my silver lake yoga studio that i've been going to for 10 years where everyone knows everyone's business and neighbors and um so it was also an opportunity for me to connect with my local community I got my COLA grant in 2006 uh, to work on a book of essays about how our social problems are really spiritual problems, and I used the money to go to India, and I never would have been able to make that trip without that funding. Yeah, I got mine in 2005, and I did uh, three artist books that were based on previously created videos, performances, installations. And I think, you know, I, this actually idea just popped into my head just now that I think that it was very affirming for me um, as a writer. Um, I, you know, and I, I just, I, I, I wrote some new work as well as for that and just to kind of affirm me as a writer and that's something that I'm doing a lot more now. I'm in a group called Queer Wise that uh, LGBTQ people over 50 and writing and performing and um, yeah, it's pretty great when I make connect those dots. Um, I got my COLA in 2014 and I think that that time and knowing that the show was happening and, and also that support from your colleagues in a way was, was really important. It also kind of allowed me to experiment um, and bring several different mediums, including film and some text that I hadn't done before, um, and music and to collaborate with a composer, which now I do regularly. So in order to sort of combine some of the science and then these different mediums and play, a bit too, which um, was really important that I have um, some more nuance in my work um, and that, that came out of that work. So, I got my COLA grant in 1997, which was the first year that COLA grants were given. Oh. And uh, it we didn't have to make a proposal. It just sort of came out of nowhere and I can really, and it was, so long ago that we got the notification by mail. <laughs> so I can remember getting the envelope that told me I, I had won this amount of money. And it was very, I think the city, it was new to the city and new to me, but I had uh, sort of focused my attention for a number of years on public art. And I had a number of public art projects kind of you know, and the back burner, which is what happens to public art projects a lot at the time. And then I got the COLA grant and it um, sort of reaffirmed and redirected me toward my studio practice. So I used the money to make a series of uh, small object-like pieces and I think it uh, encouraged me to spend more time in the studio when I had uh, gotten tired of being in the studio all by myself and I wanted to do public art. And I think that's been my career and Los Angeles enables one to do that, to go sort of back and forth between different forms. I received the COLA in 2006. And uh, I think what it helped me do was move away from the idea of the creator spectator by bipolar model became more about what we create together. It was, I created performance installation and have since then gone on to create more work like that. And also, 
about the idea of positioning, repositioning the United States and I think my own identity as the center and making it more about that pluralistic conversation that is the art. Um, and I'm currently working, just finished a project called Shooting Columbus with indigenous and non-indigenous artists. I really feel that, um, and then next I'll be working with James Luna and looking at identity in a very different way and creating spaces for things that we don't have names for of, of different ways of uh, identifying and um, looking at the world. And I, and I do feel that the COLA was that, that change, that moment of change for me.